Hello and welcome to another Arkham Horror tier list. I don't want to rank the character strengths right now because there are a lot of characters that I'm very interested in trying out and changing my opinions on. A lot of things where I'm currently in the process of testing them. So rather than ranking how strong I think the characters are at their best, like I usually do, right now I'm going to be ranking just how much I like the characters. Ranging from ones that are my clear favorites all the way down to those that invoke existential dread when I think about them. Now, normally I'll have a tier list off to the side. I have extensively thought about this and premeditated the tier list because whenever I play characters, I think about them and adjust the tier list. I just have it bookmarked. However, in this case, I obviously haven't done that. This is much more off the cuff. So let's start with my most recently played character, or one of them at least, Parallel Ash Can Pete, going straight to my clear favorites. This is a character, he's dirty fighting the card in some ways. I've talked before about why dirty fighting is my favorite card, because it allows things that were previously shit to excel in an elegant way that doesn't buff powerful things already. Ashcan Pete's parallel is exactly that. His weird trap shenanigans is so strong that it allows previously impossible awful cards like Hiding Spot and Barricade Level 3 to be all-star cards that completely warp your campaign. I played him as a flex character doing traps and difficulty 0 through Return to Forgotten Age, and my enemy management was insane. Dynamite's always been a meme card at my table. It's never, ever been worth the deck slot. But with Parallel Pete, I had like no less than at least a half dozen turns where I used Dynamite for 10 plus meaningful damage. I was able to use Hiding Spot and my guitar and barricades and the stupid customizable net trap to such tremendous effect that our fighter Rita genuinely oftentimes felt like they had nothing to do. And all of the cards I just named that allowed me to feel like Ashcan Pete should be near the top of my power tier list are usually shit cards. He is so elegantly designed to allow previously suboptimal bad cards to be really interesting and powerful that the only reason I might rank him lower is because they'll probably never print good traps now due to his existence. But he's technically an unofficial character, so maybe traps still have a shot. And since we've started with a clear favorite, I'm gonna balance it out with something that invokes existential dread in me. I really don't like Parallel Wendy. It's nothing to do with her power level or even her playstyle. I try to optimize characters. And Parallel Wendy is so unintuitive and has so many options available to exactly how you want to capitalize on her abilities that it's like trying to unravel the fucking Gordian knot. She is so difficult to think about and I've never been happy with the conclusions I've come to that at this point I'm just like, man, normal Wendy's gonna be better anyway. Why should I even bother? And that's very much, maybe it only deserves me and hate this and not quite existential dread. It's very close. I'm going to put it at the bottom, though. We'll see how it shakes out. Where's someone I feel absolutely nothing about? Winifred Habamock. Heresy from a rogue main, I suppose. But every time I look at Winifred decks, I feel underwhelmed by them. I don't feel disappointed in them. I don't feel hyped by them. I look at Winifred Habamock and I'm like, yep, she's going to draw a lot of cards on her actions that do pretty much the exact same thing as anyone else's actions but with five times the amount of time explaining which skills you're committing and why. I don't feel good about Renata to Habamok anytime I ever look at her. Being a five-foot rogue is... I think that's maybe the most boring character other than being a three-fist rogue fighter, of which there are many, but thanks to Dirty Fighting, they get to pretend they're real characters now. Winifred Habamok, not so much. Winifred Habamok is everything that makes me not like rogues, but good enough that I can't be upset about it and I, I just look at him like, yeah, oh, you know, she isn't bad. I don't hate her. But why do rogues keep doing this to me? Why is it that every time I sit down to play a rogue, I have to deal with three fist, three book, but then it balances out. Cause I'm like, yeah, I do draw an ungodly number of cards though, right? So what if it have a mock right in the middle in terms of my opinion on her every time I think about playing that character? The reason I have a tier below hate this for existential dread is Amina Zidane. Like, very explicitly, she deserves to be there for me. She's the reason that an entire expansion of Mystic Support didn't really come out that good in Scarlet Keys, because they printed a bunch of cards for a character that was pretending they didn't want to use their head, unlike the entire rest of the class. So there's a lot of support for Amina, who is still a dog shit awful investigator, by the way, that the other Mystics really get next to nothing from. This isn't me hating Amina because she's weak, this is me hating Amina because she essentially stalled out Mystic card progression for an expansion. And what's worse is that, like, she's not a cool investigator either. The Doom archetype is really interesting, and Marie does it better, and she's still not very good, even with the new support. 
And Marie's like the only investigator that got meaningful support out of Scarlet Keys that was already a mystic, in my opinion. So this is very much like a looking at the way the expansion has grown because of Amina Zidane sort of thing. And then she has no redeeming factors in my eyes. She's a three-head mystic who had a serious case of sour grapes, pretended she didn't want to use her head in the first place. And you know what? Maybe no other mystics want to use their head either in this expansion. And as it turns out, that just rubs me the wrong way pretty severely. Now, currently off camera, my tabletop group is playing through Return to Circle Undone. And in that campaign, I am playing Mark Harrigan. I am not the main fighter. I'm the flex. And this is a, my favorite deck in Arkham Horror. It's actually allowed me to move Mark Harrigan into my top five investigators because I genuinely think that Mark Harrigan as a flex investigator is stronger than as a fighting investigator. And I was planning on staying on the tier list and being lazy this whole time, but I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the deck because you might be asking serious questions right now about my sanity. This is the current Mark Harrigan deck that I'm playing. It is a deck that's designed to use Bestow Resolve and every single one of the neutral skills that draws a card so that no matter what test somebody's taking, you can throw two to four skill icons at them because Bestow Resolve does not actually follow the rules. You're not committing a card. You're using a lightning bolt ability during the test. These are different things. Bestow Resolve is the linchpin of why I love this deck so much because it's technically a support character. There's a lightning bolt window after you commit skill cards to a test. And the rules for only being able to commit one skill card to a test are not that you can only commit one skill card. Going to the skill timing window thing, which I'm not gonna pull up right now, you have to take my word on this. When you commit skill cards, it says each player may commit up to one skill card to the skill test. And then there's a lightning bolt window. So you get to commit your skill card normally, and then you can lightning bolt the bestow resolve card as well allowing you to give people, if you're running every single neutral skill in the deck that draws a card and gives you icons, pretty reliably, four icons to any test. By the way, as Mark Harrigan with Sophie, that's six icons to yourself. You can pass any test the scenario needs. So this is a huge amount of team support because you're spamming Sophie to cycle through your deck at full speed and constantly overdraw and recycle winging it. You want to run Hallowed Mirror, Tetsuo Mori for Soak, Second Wind, and this deck hasn't ever really felt like it was low on actions. It's always felt like I had time to do the healing because I'm a flex, so I had to deal with every enemy. And I've been able to do a ton of team support, a good bit of clue finding with winging it, and an ungodly amount with the stupid fucking runic axe, because you come down to the inscriptions, my zoom is clearly not right for this. You come down to the inscriptions, and what you do is you script weave ancient power with elders, accuracy, and, oh, it's all right here, I see. Accuracy and power. So let's say you need to kill a three health enemy and it has three or four fists, right? You inscribe accuracy to get over the hump. You probably use Sophie as well just to draw a card and make sure you beat like the minus force. Then you do power twice to kill it in one hit. And with your three script weaves, you're going to do elders three times. So now, now what happens is that you get to get three clues if you succeed by an amount equal to the shroud value, which is very oftentimes not hard to do with Mark Harrigan. Like I said, accuracy Sophie acts is base 10. In a lot of situations, you're up four over succeeding by the shroud already. If you're not, commit overpower, bestow something. You have solutions to it. You have turns very regularly where you just absolutely wasted three health enemy in one action to get three clues, and you can skip the next two turns. You've done your part as the flex character for two whole rounds at that point, but you're not done. You have this insane support package with bestow resolve, you can cycle these unlimited because Brandon Cathuggas will put them in your discard pile and you draw fast enough to redraw the second copy very, very easily. You can soak for your team. You can heal your team. You have a lot of extra action, some safeguard, and you reliably draw the one copy because you're fucking Mark Harrigan and you're playing so much extra draw compared to a normal Mark. The deck's insane. And I don't rank characters at the top of my favorites just for being powerful, but the way he's powerful is so satisfying and fun. You feel like you can do anything. It's a really clever use of all Mark's strengths to not just play the one generic fighting deck that Mark obviously has. I really, really enjoy Flex Mark. And from here, we're gonna start going through just end release order, starting with Roland. And I definitely really like Roland. I don't love Roland. And if I were to put him in pretty cool, it would only be because he continually makes me think, ah, oh, he's not as good as I wanted to be. And that's not enough. I think Roland is a very good investigator design. Personally, I love the decks where you run deduction level two, perception level two, but you don't boost your book at all. You just give it to the seeker instead. They'll be really good at using it, much better than you. And it's your job to safeguard around with them and protect them. So they'll be next to you. It's not a problem. 
I really like the weird pseudo flex Roland fighter you can play. I really like the idea of a fighter that generates value by getting clues for its team, as opposed to being even better at killing the enemies that are already dead. And on that note, we're going to skip around a little bit because I'm always going to think about other characters as I go through. I'm putting that show and I just like this investigator. I don't hate him at all, but I don't like jumping through hoops to do something that everyone else does naturally. If you hear me bitch about rogues using foot, this will come up. But Nacho just has to make sure he has the money for events and make sure he has the draw for events and really needs those boxing gloves. Hey, I need deep knowledge. I didn't find my boxing gloves, guys. I don't like it. I don't like being super reliant on drawing your boxing gloves. I don't like having a fear that my axe or my hammer is going to run out of bullets, which, you know, those are melee weapons. They don't. If I'm playing a character with guns, extra ammo is usually going to either be two of in a high draw deck or two of with one of them under stick to the plan. Everyone else feels less at risk of running out of cards than that show. Now, the reality is I've seen like four campaigns of that show because my table loves playing him and I've never seen him run out of cards. He's always been like, no, I can kill four more enemies. It's fine. But even when I play him and I'm the one saying that and I'm like teleporting across the map or teleporting enemies across the map rather with get over here and I've got a handful of events that kill the boss, I still don't like the feeling of metering out resources to do my job when other characters aren't. Other characters have really cool shit in their hand, not just eight bullets. Because that's essentially what it is. Every card in your hand is one bullet or one round, I guess I should say, in a flamethrower because it's certainly not a bullet. And I think round is the generic game terminology. But I don't like the feel of Nacho. Also, the fact he only has one deck doesn't help. If he had a way to play Runagax, he'd probably be a better character. But hey, that's Guardians in a nutshell. If you're using Runagax, you're moving up in the tier list. I really like Daisy. I don't know how much I like Daisy. Do I love Daisy? I like her more than Roland. I'm sure of that. Do I love Daisy? No, I'd play more Daisy if I did. I really think I might have put her in love this year before the massive nerf to research notes where it's now just net zero. It's never going to be absolutely crazy like it had the possibility of being before. The Mythos Resilient Clue Dropper Daisy was a deck I absolutely loved. But part of that's that after you finish setting up all your Clue Dropper bullshit, you made up for the lost time with your research notes. But now that research notes are just making it not a problem that you're dropping the clues, you're still behind from the setup phase. And I really don't like the archetype very much outside of specifically Daryl, because Daryl has other things you can use the evidence for and already has built in mythos mitigation, much more than just access to warden protection does. So while I really like Daisy, I mostly like her as like a tempo based seeker with five book and access to free investigate actions on Grim Memoir. She's very close to love this because of Grim Memoir, but not quite. She's just very powerful and very fun to play. Not super interesting, honestly. And having just mentioned Daryl, I kind of love Daryl. Daryl's a really strong character that plays very differently from other Seekers. Managing evidence is actually fun, unlike managing Nathaniel Cho. Evidence is you put a couple cards into play and now you have a resource you get to manage. Not your entire deck is a single resource that you're managing. And I really enjoy like the massive amount of team support. You play with a one-head rogue, they draw Rotting Remains. Nah, dude, you just take one horror. It's not a big deal. Here's an evidence. I don't care what you roll. You can draw negative eight. It doesn't matter. You're rolling zero against one at the end of the day. We all know that's what's happening. But zero against three would have been a lot worse, and it's not hard for Daryl to provide that level of team support. The fact that he's a really fun, high-tempo character on top of that, when you play him outside of Clue Dropper, or has alternative builds that are game-breaking in the form of Clue Dropper Daryl, where, you know, the Mythos deck just doesn't get to do anything anymore. Obviously, Clue Dropper Daryl's a lot weaker than it used to be because it's fair now, but you already had, like, this constant push and pull before, and I'm going to miss that where you were judging... Do I want to get clues faster or do I want to save evidence to make my team safer? And now you just sort of get clues at the speed you're allowed to and spend all the evidence willy nilly after that. But it's still pretty cool. I still really, really like Daryl, even though he's a little bit weaker, but he's not a clear favorite. He's just strong in fun ways. Getting back on track, Skidzo Tool is going straight into hate this. I feel no existential dread on Skidzo Tool. And to clarify the difference in these, why I've named it existential dread, it's not just a Lovecraft meme. A character that gives me existential dread is a character I hate, where when I think about them, it, it requires me to explain how they affect the game as a whole. My hatred for them goes beyond just what that character implies. And Skidzo Tool is a dog shit awful character. Parallel Skids is not going to be ranked here. Parallel Skids is one of my favorite characters in the game. I'm just going to go ahead and slap Parallel Skids straight into clear favorites right now. Because he is. He's awesome. I absolutely love Parallel Skids. We'll get back to him in a second. But Original Skids is a three-fist fighter without access to any good weapons that have unlimited uses because he's only got access to level two blue. 
meaning you're metering out resources with guns, or you're trying desperately to make this Switchblade hit for like eight, which is not easy to do with base three fists, but it is doable. I almost want to move original skids up to just dislike, because so many of the things where the card ball is improved are improved because you can use them on skids, right? Like, the Taros are a good addition to the game. And in the thick of it, Ace of Fist, is that what it's called? The Plus Fist Taro and Guardian. Ace of Swords. That allows you to make skids, sometimes, a four fist fighter on turn one. Dirty Fighting was built for Skids O'Toole so that Tony Morgan couldn't use it, and now Skids O'Toole can totally be Tony Morgan after he spent an action evading. Which, you know, you have to have acceptable foot, and that's not actually that easy, because it turns out forfeit does... Yeah, the words are hard. It turns out forefoot is not easily dodging most of the enemies in the game. You actually do have to invest in this, and it's not super easy. So while a ton of the things that I like for improving the card pool directly affect skids... I still hate skids. Like, I, I'm going to mention that I like how he makes other cards look better, but that's not a point for him. Not really. Now, parallel skids, he gets to use all the, well, not the tarot. He gets to use dirty fighting exactly the same, except he's playing the best big money deck in the game, and he's got the coolest ability in the game. Not only is he Ginny, but more interactive and in making more money by gambling every turn. When you time your gambling right, you can do things like cycle manual decks at will, you can use quick thinking to generate an action. Really interesting. You can use quick thinking to generate an action during the enemy phase. A hunter enemy can hunt to you. You quick thinking, dodge them, dirty fight them, and kill them. Or even if they live through the hit, at least they didn't hit you unless you auto failed, which has happened to me. But still, it's really fucking cool. I absolutely love Parallel Skids. He has one of the best abilities in the game. It's so much fun and so powerful. He makes the stat line work by having a deck to consistently get big money online fast enough to just fix all the problems. A lot of big money characters, I like playing them, but I'm not the biggest fan of it. It has a lot of setup time. I've just done it a lot on different characters, but Parallel Skids is unironically just really fun to play with big money. And it's because Parallel Skids doesn't need to play Faustian Bargain and Hot Streak four times. He just makes the money naturally while doing other cool shit in the process. And I guess I'll cover the other parallels of characters as I hit them as well. So let's grab Parallel Daisy. And I hate this. Uh, while I'm here, I've also rated Roland and I hate this. <laughs> These characters are, in my opinion, just strictly worse than their originals, but not in ways that are easy to make sense of. Parallel roll when you have to look at all the directives, really think about how you build the deck, and eventually come to the conclusion that, wow, this is terrible. And I've looked at roll and decks other people have made a lot. I've looked at parallel roll and a lot myself. I can't even find it in me to want to play him because I could be playtesting a different build of roll that isn't parallel, and parallel roll is just frustrating and inept in every way. Now, moving on to Daisy Walker, she traded out a good Mythos defensive stat for a one in head, but don't worry, once you're set up, you'll be invincible to head test, basically. Not really important to me. Daisy Walker already had Ward of Protection and three head and was a Seeker, so I just assumed she'd be passing her head test. But sure, you can set up for high head now. What's, what's the downside? Oh, you lost the thing that made you Daisy. You don't get free actions anymore. Why the fuck am I playing you? And the answer is there, there isn't one. If you're playing Parallel Daisy, you're trying to do something silly with stacking head, and there's just not a payoff for doing that. Taking away the thing that's iconic about a character and just giving them an absolutely pointless goose chase, where it's like, you can keep building up your head, but there's no payoff for doing that, it doesn't matter. And there's not enough books in the game where it's worth using her once per game ability to like do anything. It's never going to catch up to the original Daisy, and it's never going to do that much in the first place. If there was like a really cool parallel daisy that had a bunch of head-based fighting books and you could hit the boss for like 15 the turn it spawned as a lightning bolt, that'd be sick. But that's not really a thing either. But without clear design support behind these ideas, it's just sort of a waste of time to pursue any of it. And next up, let's grab Wendy. I've already talked about her parallel. I hate it. Unlike Wendy. Ah, uh, she's not my clear favorite though. She, I love her. She's great, but she's not a clear favorite. Wendy's ability to just like make her terrible do something stats not matter puts all the rogues to shame. Her card pool of five survivor rogue two is obviously good. It would be better flipped and pressed and sabotaged that stat line. It would have been too good or that card pool rather by having a terrible stat line. So Wendy is what you get if you want to play survivor rogue, but it's still very, very strong. She has a lot of unique stuff involving managing her discard pile, involving recurring assets and wait, not assets, events in ways no one else can. 
There's always some degenerate infinite or pseudo infinite Wendy deck on the horizon, but even when you play Wendy normally, she's just incredibly fun. And I, I always enjoy playing her or watching someone else play her. And I think I really enjoy characters that feel very powerful and you don't just have all of your power sitting on the board in front of you. Ignore what I said about Nathaniel Cho. It's just that Nathaniel Cho only does one thing and one method. Wendy's able to do much more versatile things. And she's also able to play assets that actually help her do her job other than a mandatory boxing gloves. I'm looking at lockpicks, by the way, in case you're wondering what I'm referring to, but there's a ton of other ones as well that are very good on Wendy. Then it doesn't feel like Nathaniel Cho is getting any value out of anything on his board other than boxing gloves and beat comp. I like how every time I talk about somebody, I'm like, this is why they're not Cho, by the way. I only dislike Cho, but like everything I dislike about Cho almost applies to someone else. It's just like at the tipping point for him. And next up we have Agnes, Parallel Agnes. Oh shit, is that a hard no opinion from me? I'm gonna be so upset when I make this whole list and I have no <laughs> mystics above no opinion. I think I would put Parallel Agnes in pretty cool if I thought any of the spells she were recurring were worth the hassle of doing it. I'm actually close to moving her to down to dislike this because her whole build to me has never really felt like it had a reason to be played over the normal mystic shit. I don't think they're bad characters. I don't dislike them. I almost was surprised I don't really think they're cool. But yeah, no opinion on them. They're just mystics who do mystic things. And Agnes Baker does cooler mystic things that are not worth the trouble of doing and are like, why are you not playing with Pete Sylvester? You were invincible before. You, why are you not doing that anymore? Like, cutting Pete Sylvester and Lucky 3 and at a crossroads to go recur cards that are about the same as the assets you were using previously just doesn't feel worth. I'm putting her in dislike. A lot of the time, a character will probably move down an entire tier if every time I try to optimize the character, I feel frustrated and like I don't understand why this character should be played instead of X or why this character is worth building for. And that's very much what's happening here to Parallel Agnes. Rex Murphy. I didn't mean to put him in pretty cool, but maybe that's where he deserves to be. The reason Rex Murphy might move up is because he can play a support deck. You can play 2x Deep Knowledge, 2x False and Bargain, 2x Eye of Truth. You're so strong at your job that you can absolutely waste time, run William T. Mailson, just run some random clue dropping cards as you make up for the tempo loss of doing it, and really help your team by helping to mitigate the Mythos deck and support them with generic support cards that work on them, because Seeker is the best support class, make no mistake. It's also the best at everything else other than fighting. I think Rex is pretty cool. I think his flex cards allowing him to play a team support role is actually really, really interesting. I think the fact that he's so strong you can do any dumb Seeker idea you want on Rex is actually pretty cool. But he's also just like a Seeker with a normal stat line that gets one more clue per turn, and yeah, that's nuts, that's completely broken because Seekers were already at the top of the power curve, but that doesn't make me like him very much. The team support stuff, getting access to Falsian Bargain so that like almost your entire deck either gets a clue or works on your teammates in really meaningful ways is really cool. But other than that, I don't have strong opinions about him. I mostly like Rex as he shows off all the cool other shit Seekers get to do, if you want to. Right, Parallel Rex isn't real, that's a custom thing. I guess I'm not ranking that. Well, let's get on to Jenny. And, oh man, oh no, where do I rank Jenny? Where do I rank Jenny, shit? Okay, so here's the thing, right? I really like playing with Jenny in the second half of a campaign when you're running Green Man Medallion because it's degenerate and you have 100 experience and you get to play with all the cards, every one of them. However, playing with the Green Man Medallion is actual factual trash. Playing alongside someone with the Green Man Medallion and Kara Zobel, because you better believe she's still taking that, is even worse. I hate Original Jenny. Like, Original Jenny is one of the reasons I kept playing Rogues when we started the game. That sounds like a confusing statement. I kept playing Rogues and became our table's Rogue main because every time I played a Rogue, I would barely carry my weight and be like, shit, I know I can do better. I need to make this work. And that was mostly because, like, the original rogues weren't very good and the card pool didn't support them. Original Jenny is terrible in the exact way that all the rogues are terrible, except like also she has a funny stat line. It's not that much worse than your normal rogue, like Skids has the same do something stats. Finn has one more book, which is really important, but like it's at this point in the card pool, her stat line's not that much worse than the average rogue. Don't look at Trish and Tony. I really don't like the original Jenny. I don't quite hate her. But I would never play the original Jenny, and I would never encourage anyone at my table to play the original Jenny. I would tell them to play with Green Man Medallion. And I would fucking hate that. The optimizer in me moves Jenny down to Existential Dread. 
because it means we have to play with a Green Man Medallion Karen's Oval character. They are the main character. They will steal the show in the second half of the campaign. Please babysit them before they do so that they can actually do something later. And for what it's worth, I genuinely don't actually mind this that much in gameplay. Like, I don't like this. This is not for Karen's Opal. This is for Green Man Medallion. I do not want to be ready to end the scenario. And Jenny says, can we sit here for three more turns? Because if we do, I can get double double for free. And right now, winning this turn costs me two experience. Because Karen's Opal, generally you can trust the rogue to not die with it. And if they don't, you laugh at them and you berate them mercilessly for the rest of the campaign every time they fail a test. You're like, you know, if you were still your original character, you probably would have had one more in that stat. Like, I don't mind Karen Zobel at all as a player at the table. It's the Green Man Medallion that sucks. It's absolutely terrible to play alongside of. Because if you're optimizing and you better believe that I'm optimizing at my table, it just isn't fun. <laughs> you run the Doom Clock down every single scenario. Every single scenario, you have to ask, hey, is there an Ancient Evil variant? Okay, there is. Cool, we need to leave three turns before the Doom Counter. Tell me when you draw Ancient Evils, because that gives me another turn to Green Man Medallion. And then the player playing, Jenny, has to know what card they're buying, because you can actually leave earlier if they know they already have the six they need for Ace in the Hole or whatever the hell they're doing. It's so unfun. It's the least fun thing in the world. It's not as... No, it's worse than anything else. It's even worse than, like, delve too deep men maxing. It's so unfun. I hate Jenny Barnes. Not, no, I don't hate Jenny Barnes at all. I actually, Jenny Barnes, pretty cool. Terrible stat line, bad character. Really enjoy trying to make them work. But I'm ranking the Green Man Medallion because it overshadows everything else about her. Next up, we have a Zoe Parallel Zoe. Actually, that might have been right. I think I'm a strong no opinion on Zoe. Like, it's pretty cool that she gets to use her splash for specifically Spectral Razor Promise of Power down the rabbit hole, but that's about it. Fun fact, Zoe Samaras gets five purple splash and takes the exact same five splash cards. I like Parallel Zoe more because she's essentially make your own Holy Spear. There's really cool combos you can use with her, and I actually am getting progressively more hyped about the blur stuff as the next expansion gets more and more revealed. I'm not going to spoil any Blur stuff in this video in case people have been avoiding that and want to see it all when it's finally released. But there's some stuff that has me specifically hyped about Bless Builds, and Zoe is one of the best enablers, Parallel Zoe is one of the best enablers of that stuff. I actually think I am very fond of Parallel Zoe. I think she is the best and coolest enabler of Bless Builds for other characters. And if those tokens aren't needed by them, you can do really strong stuff yourself with them. I think I'm a big fan of Parallel Zoe. Not so much original. Original Zoe is just, you know, four fist guardian, do the thing. It's not complicated. You have more money. You can make a meme deck where you try to get agency back about. It doesn't really seem worth it, to be honest. If you're playing Dream Eaters, it's worth it because there's so many damn swarming enemies. But that's like, I, I rank her one higher in one campaign. Who cares? I think I'm happy with very good for Parallel because it's such strong blessed support, but no opinion on the vanilla. Gem, Parallel Gem. Okay, first of all, I dislike Jim. Jim's weak and he doesn't do anything interesting. I don't hate Jim, he's not offensive, but he's weak and he doesn't do anything interesting. Let me go remind myself what Parallel Jim is. He's a thing I've theory crafted, but not a thing I've gotten to play with at my table. The answer was that Parallel Jim is the best curse user in the game right now, up for debate once we see all the curse support coming out with the next expansion, but unironically, really cool curse support coming out of Parallel Jim. A, having access to a lot of the cards relevant to it is just very nice. Generic curse support gives him access to deep knowledge and Faustian bargain, which yeah, the original gem had, but he's original gem. Don't talk to me about him. Parallel gem has the ability to get more charges on curse assets by, or sorry, own assets by drawing curses. And that is a huge incentive to play with curses. No one else has that. Literally no one else has that. And even though I don't think parallel gem is particularly strong, I like seeing a character with a reason to play curses. I wish he were even better at it, but it's fine that he's not. It's still a strong and interesting effect, and he's going to move Jim up the list a lot once I finally get to play with him. Uh, in case you're confused on that statement, when I rank characters on my actual power tier list, I rank them according to their best version, their best deck played well, and if they have parallels, whatever combination of generic and parallel is actually best. So this will probably get Jim well out of my bottom tier once I get around to playing with it, unless I've grossly overhyped Curse Jim in my head. But that's what my table kept telling me about Flexmark, and my entire table is a believer now, so 
I don't know, maybe Cursed Gem should be even higher. Maybe I'm restraining myself because of Original Gem. But for now, as a speculatively pretty cool, that's where Parallel Gem will stand. Original Ash Can Pete. He's definitely at least pretty cool. I really like Original Gem. I'm putting him in very good immediately. I really enjoy that the reason Parallel Pete felt bad initially is not having Duke. And something really funny about Parallel Pete is much you get a ton of variants, a ton of variants, because you you run both sets of weaknesses and signatures. So you're allowed to do that. They're not replacements, they're additions. So now Duke is in your deck, and whether or not you hit Duke in your mulligan is really important. And like half my game is like, oh no, short supply, Duke's in the trash. He's just not happening this game. But original Parallel Pete being built around measuring out your resources. You get one Duke action a turn. That needs to be Investigate for the free move. How do you make your other two actions line up with Duke Investigate plus move? Trying to solve that puzzle, and there are very powerful tools available to solving that puzzle super efficiently. It's a really fun thing to play. Whether it's Discard Pete, Difficulty Zero Pete, whatever you're doing, there are a lot of powerful ways to play Ashcan Pete that feel very interactive. He plays like no one else. He's really unique, really fun to play. Decently powerful. I really like original Ashcan quite a lot. Menti fan. Oh, no, I don't think she's that good. I don't. I don't think she's that good at all. I don't find her scavenging stuff to be the strongest thing she can do or even very interesting in the first place. I think she's just a good high tempo seeker and being powerful is fun. Being powerful and more mythos resilient than your average seeker is fun. I really, really don't mind her weakness at all, even though it is a crippling weakness. I think it's a thing where you play around it and you build around it and it's just not a big issue. And the main reason she's only in pretty cool and not much higher is because analytical mind is just a one in 30 and there's no way to force it out of your deck faster. There's no way to tutor it specifically. Don't get me wrong. Survivor has a ton of draw. You can build support men decks that cycle through their deck very, very quickly and then start giving those same draw cards out of crossroads, deep knowledge, etc., to their teammates so that they can draw through their whole deck very quickly while you support them with analytical mind and draw through your deck even faster the second time around. Analytical mind's really, really cool. But because it's a character defining card that's just a one of that you cannot tutor, it makes her very frustrating. Characters where their signature is why you play them, but they don't start with it kind of suck in that way. And that's really holding her out of the higher tiers because every time I play men, the reason I'm playing men is analytical mind. And that is like, it's still really cool when you have it, but having to build to draw it is just kind of lame. Safina Rousseau. I don't like Safina Rousseau. I played Safina Rousseau with a limited card pool. So I was like, I'm going to go back and replay Safina Rousseau. My teammates did this before I got around to it, and they had a terrible time. It did not go well for them. But every time I look at a Safina deck, I'm like, wow, I really wish I had a more head or more foot. Because as it turns out, foot's not actually an easy stat to use. I'll elaborate on this idea briefly. When you use a head asset, it gives you plus head. When you use a gun, it gives you plus foot. When you find clues with book, you're a seeker, your stat's fucking broken, and you have a magnifying glass giving you plus book as well, usually. When you try to use foot as rogue, most of the things that use foot do not give you bonus foot. When you backstab someone, it just uses foot. There's nothing that gives you intrinsic bonuses on the action. You have to stack a ton of bonuses in your other assets. And it's actually pretty hard to get your foot to a workable number a reliable workable number because you just see a lot of guys with like three or four foot and that doesn't sound like a problem three or four fist is honestly kind of trivial for a fighter to deal with you should be able to do that easily but dodging that same number is notably harder because of this when i find characters that are forced to engage in foot matters archetypes and they don't have five foot it gets really frustrating trying to optimize them i'm building a character around spamming events that use foot and head and my deck's taken up by that and i have to try to cram the rest of the deck with stat pump assets and skills there's just not enough room for everything i want to do and i find her deeply frustrating to build and i have never seen a version of safina perform at a level where it felt like it was worth the frustrating exercise in deck building in the first place also the limited collection safina i played was played alongside rex and mark so like obviously she did not steal the show exactly in that campaign <laughs> oh the fourth player was wendy adams you can imagine that my dunwich collection safina did not do very well anyway akachi onelli Straight to no opinion. I, if you're watching this, I assume you know what they do because I'm certainly not explaining it. And so you know why I don't have an opinion. She's a five head mystic with more charges and a limited card pool. That's it. There's nothing about her. There's nothing to hate. There's nothing to like. Anyone who puts Akachi anywhere else on their tier list is, I don't know. They're lying for some reason. There's no reason to have strong opinions about Akachi at all. Love William Yorick though. That guy's awesome. 
William Yorick is one of the coolest characters in the game. Is he? Holy shit, survivors are ranking high on this tier list, aren't they? That's a lot of survivors in the top right now. Checks out, it's a good class. Unlike Seekers, they're not good because they're powerful, they're good because they're doing genuinely interesting things that are still somewhat strong. But yeah, Will Yorick's recursion playstyle is something no one else has. Like, yeah, all survivors recur, no one to the degree that Will Yorick does. You play short supply because it gives you a 15 card opening hand. The graveyard's just your hand when you're Will Yorick, it's awesome. The fact that he's basically invincible and a competent fighter to boot is really, really nice. A lot of survivor fighters struggle because they have bad card pools for actually getting weapons. Well, Yorick gets access to survival knives and machetes, and the rest of them don't really matter, but you can use other weapons too. I uh, love playing with or as Will Yorick. I remember seeing a, an incredibly greedy sled dog deck at Edge of the Earth that was so fucking strong, but it also just required my press and deck to give him money. I was like, I'll just false the embargo you, it's fine. <laughs> Because it turns out Will Yorick can't pay for that many sled dogs. But everything about Will Yorick has always been, like, absolutely charming to me. I really like the character. It's not a clear favorite of mine, because, like, he just hits dudes, right? He hits dudes and he plays assets for free when he hits them enough. And that's cool, but it's it's not super interesting. It's not fun enough to play for me to put him in my favorites, but he's a very fun character. Thanks to the taboo on Lola, she does not go into existential dread tier. However, she does still kind of suck, and she's a neutral character where, you know, her ability is that she got access to all the cards, but uh, she's not able to use them very well. I dislike Lola. I don't hate her. The taboo fixed the terrible things about her, so now she's just like, you know, bad in a way that's not fun, but she's not terrible anymore. I don't have super strong opinions about her, but I'd rather I didn't play with Lola and if anyone else tells me that you're going to play with Lola and encourages me to play less interesting characters because I know I need to put them on my back and carry them through the rest of the campaign because they're going to do just enough to say they're not griefing, they're not that bad. Lola's better than making them sound. Very few characters, except for Amina Zidane, are actually weighing your team down. Most characters are doing their part, and even one or two strong characters per team is more than enough to crush a campaign. Lola's just bad in boring ways. I mostly just like her because she could have been so much cooler. She doesn't stand up to being what I want out of a neutral investigator. Leo Anderson is a character I really like. I don't really enjoy playing him that much, but having him on my team is really nice. And the idea of his final decks, like what you can build into with them is really cool. Because you can play a four action character with access to Hallowed Mirror and Decent Troll, you can play a really good team support character where after you finish killing the enemies, you can help find clues or heal your teammates, because he does have free book access to stuff like Big Money and Gios. Leo's definitely one of the more interesting fighters from a deck building perspective, but the reality is he's not actually that incredible at fighting. His crippling weakness to foot treacheries is not something I'm a fan of, although many Guardians do share this, because let's be real, one foot and two foot, no different. The difference between one foot and two foot is not that big. It's You're going to fail the Mythos test. There's no real difference. It's just how much work is required if it's something really bad and your team needs to save you, and it's not a big difference there either. I like Leo a lot because of what he offers to do, but the reality is when people play him, they're just playing like a dude that shoots gun with slightly more friends than normal for most of the campaign. So, like, the idea of Leo has always been cooler than what Leo has actually been doing, but then you adaptable and on the hunt and you kill Nair Lathotep before he can spawn properly, huh? That's pretty good. Because of that specific interaction, I'm putting him in very good. He always lets me down a little bit in play, but adaptable on the hunt for Nair Lathotep is so funny. I love that. I guess you could say any character with on the hunt meets the same criteria, but who runs on the hunt? Don't at me. Ursula Downs. Very good. Immediately. Actually, I love this character. I get mad every time anyone talks about Ursula because they're always about to shit talk Ursula. No one's going to say something nice about Ursula. And it bothers me because you move every turn. Like maybe if you're playing a four player campaign, you're not moving every turn. But generally speaking, two or three players, most turns you're taking a move action, which means that her ability is a free investigate every turn, which is absolutely nuts. That's basically Rex's ability with a slightly different condition. Rex needs you to pass by two, Ursula needs you to pass at all a second time. Ursula's ability is really, really strong. Her access to relics does make her very nearly mono seeker, but it's mono seeker with Karen's Oval, and your team was going to lose the scenario anyway if you died because you're the seeker and no one else is getting clues. So, I don't really mind. I like having Karen's Obel. Seekers do a lot of good work with more experience. 
I like being a movement-based character, and with cards like Eon Chart, Pathfinder, and Hiking Boots that make it really easy to move, you don't even need to spend that action a lot of the time in the late game. It's been a thing I've seen many times where my tabletop teammates will play Ursula, and in a late game scenario, there's one location left with a ton of clues, because some scenarios are built like that. And you know what Ursula does? She Pathfinders out and Eon Charts back in to trigger her ability without spending an action. The need to move on Ursula is not a problem. There are ways to move without spending actions. Her ability is super fun to use, super powerful. She's not the most interesting character. I'm, I think maybe I like Ursula more because I have to like listen to people hate on her and it's caused me to like push further in the other direction every time I hear this shit. Like honestly, she only really deserves to be in very good. I don't love Ursula because at the end of the day, she's just a more mobile seeker and that's really powerful and really fun to play, but it's not super interesting. There's not that much deck variation for Ursula, but like, I don't know why everyone hates Ursula. They're like, oh, she sucks. She has a bad card. What do you mean she has a bad card pool? Are you going to tell me Harvey Walters is a bad card pool? He has access to Seeker Zero. That's better than pretty much any rogue. You don't even need the experience cards. So anytime someone talks about bad card pool or bad ability on Ursula, which is always central arguments against Ursula, I'm just, I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? And then at the end of the day, I just think she's a more mobile seeker and seekers tend to rank highly because they're powerful and that makes them fun. And being mobile is fun. It means the part of the game that sucks the most doesn't happen to you. And in fact, when you're doing it for free because you built your deck to do that, you're getting benefits. It's just a really fun character to play. Not like top tier design, but definitely fun, definitely strong. And I don't like hearing people shit talk her all the time. I think Finn might be in love with this. I don't think he's in clear favorites. At this point, I have seen Kluver Fen, Flex Fen, and Fighter Fen all post like dirty fighting and underworld market. And I think confidently that Fen is at his best as a fighter. I know that might be heresy. Here's why dirty fighting and his ability is absolutely nuts as a fighter. If you're playing Kluver Fen, you're really not doing justice to what this character is capable of. Like, what's even the point of your ability as a Kluver? So you can be on your own. You don't need to be on your own. Ask the fighter to do it. If you're the dedicated Kluver, that implies your team has a dedicated fighter. So you shouldn't be valuing being on your own as the point of having an ability. That, like, every two to three turns, you can evade a guy for free. That's not good. So Flex Fen and Fighter Fen are really the only options. And Flex Rogues have this nasty habit of setting up forever. They just have to play too many assets and get too much money, and it takes too long. Fighter Finn has less setup time than Flex Finn, and when he finds himself with dead time, because he's really efficiently killing enemies by free action evading, dirty fight punch, free action reaction, fire the 25. If it had like six health that you auto failed, then you stab it with your other hand switch knight. Like when you find yourself with free time, because you don't set up that much, if you're playing with big money stuff, or even just like running out of deck slots, you cut your skills and put in Gios, right? You can easily be a five book investigator through a variety of means where now with your free time as the fighter, you're like, hey, guys, you want me to go just like knock out this three shroud, two shroud location? And you can. That's one of the upsides of Leo Anderson as well, is that when you finish setting up, you can actually easily kill all the enemies and have spare time to help investigate. I think fighter Fen is really, really strong, and it's the only way to have a character that reliably uses his ability. I said this when I was talking to my own team. Fighter Finn compared to Fighter Winnie, Finn is essentially 33% more fighter than Winnie because of his free action. Winnie drawing doesn't matter. Her foot is counteracted by Finn's access to track shoes. Like, the reality is, when I see Fighter Finn, it's got so many actions due to that free reaction. It's so fun to watch because of all the reaction abilities and action economy that the character gets. It's not the best fighter in the traditional sense, but in terms of crisis management fighting, like you suddenly you're playing the witch house scenario, all three rats and Brown Jenkins spot at once. You're desperately wishing someone was running dynamite. A Finn Edwards that's been set up already can probably deal with all of that in one round semi reliably, right? That's not true of a lot of fighters. And in case you're wondering if that sounded a little bit wrong to you, like that's not enough actions. Quick thinking is part of it. But uh, fun fact, the 25 automatics reaction after you invade an enemy at your location, perform the above fight ability without spending an action, does not require you to shoot the enemy you dodged. Nothing says that. You can trip an enemy, hit him with dirty fighting, hit him with your 25, trip the next enemy, and then shoot the first enemy with your 25. There's nothing preventing that action from happening. And it's so funny to watch 
than tripping rats and then shooting the boss instead. I really enjoy being on a team with Fighter Fen. And it's Fighter Fen, and later on we'll talk about Rita. These characters have more setup time. Fighter rogues are, other than Tony, have some problems in the first turns. Rita has some problems in the first turns, but they really need to get certain assets in play. I'm looking at you, Dirty Fighting, as well as their weapons before they're online. And it's given me more respect for these sorts of characters playing alongside them, where I think when you're rating characters in terms of power level, you should assume their team is trying to cover their weaknesses pretty aggressively. Like, Finn having setup time doesn't matter at all when he's played alongside Flex Mark Harrigan, because it's like, oh no, the fighter can't kill the enemy. That's all right, I was going to tell you to set up instead, because it's actually filled with three clues, I need to use the Zax. Like, I don't mind setup time as a component of a character at all, unless the setup time doesn't feel worth it. And Fighter Fen minimizes the setup time pretty severely. So I really enjoy playing with or as Fen. Oh, Father Mateo's going straight into this like this. He's a blessed character that doesn't feel like he's very good at putting blesses in the bag, because none of them are. He's a blessed character that doesn't pay off for it very strong. Like, here's why you play bless on Father Mateo, right? You use Favor of the Sun, an ancient covenant. And that lets you pretend you're not a forehead mystic by auto-passing on Right of Seeking. That's why you're using it. That's the payoff. It doesn't really do much else. Like, you can pass any scenario test. Any blessed character can do that as long as they have Ancient Covenant. But the main reason you're playing Father Mateo is, I mean, to be honest, it's probably that Winifred's on your team. So being able to turn off her auto feels kind of a big deal. She cares a lot about that. But honestly, Father Mateo is just not an interesting character to play. I He's all right. He's not bad. He's more than acceptable in terms of power level. But the stuff he's doing just makes me realize aggressively how much more work Bless and Curse needed, and I am thrilled to see the expansion doing that. Maybe next time I make a tier list like this, there'll be enough support for Bless and Curse that I'll think Father Mateo goes up. Odds are I'll continue to think that other characters do it better than him, and it makes it even sadder and will fall down to hate this, but who knows? I love Calvin. I mean, honestly, I Calvin might be a clear favorite. <laughs> I love Calvin, and part of this is that I refuse to play Calvin. I've theorycrafted a lot of Calvin, and I've given it to our resident Calvin main, who has slowly transitioned from Joe main to Calvin main to Vincent main. Now he's a Rita main, right? He might be becoming a Monterey Jack main, but he just like picks a jank character and grinds it out on them and plays different decks each time. And I wouldn't really enjoy playing Calvin much. It would stress me the fuck out. It would not be powerful enough to justify the hoops you jump through. Like, as a power level thing, Calvin sucks. But I just really like watching Galvin. I, I'm not going to put him in clear favorites, although someone at my table certainly wouldn't. But I like watching Calvin. I think he's a really cool character. I think if you play him with a table of weak people, you will stand out as one of the reasons that your team is weak, because you do nothing in the first half of the scenario. But on the whole, there's a lot of room for experimentation with Calvin and the two-thirds of the deck that aren't just keeping you alive. I think the argument that Calvin only has one deck is just stupid. It's like saying Guardians only have one deck, and it's kind of true. All Guardians need to run the cards that make you fight. You need the guns, you need the beat cops, you need the skills. There's a lot of stuff that all the Guardians run, and all the Calvins run the variety of cards that keep them alive. But, like, if you're optimizing your decks, one-third of every Seeker deck's the same. It's deep knowledge, deduction, practice makes perfect, yada yada, you get the drill. The reality is that every character is going to have a set of their deck locked in, no matter what you're going for. That's not unique to Calvin. So I think Calvin actually has a lot of fun room for experimentation. The idea of what he's doing is really strong. I think if I played Calvin more, and I'm going to rank him according to that, I'd end up putting him in very good, because he's just not strong enough to justify the shit you're going through. If Calvin were a better character, he'd make it into my clear favorites. But as it stands, you're jumping through a lot of hoops to just, like, hit with Fire Axe for two or to uh, find one clue for one action. Like, getting stats doesn't matter. Mark Harrigan started with stats. Basically the same stats if he taps Sophie, right? After Sophie, his stat line is five, seven. I don't know what his book is. I think it would be four and five. That's pretty much a setup Calvin. Except instead of taking damage to get there, I can just take damage when I need it, which is not often. Unless I'm trying to draw cards and the stat line wasn't why. Calvin is... His lack of action compression is what really holds him down from being effective. He just becomes reliable, not fast. And fast is what actually matters. Reliable is the assumption that is made, because if you aren't reliable, then you're going straight to the bottom of the tier list for being trash and not being able to do your job. So the fact that Calvin's payoff is being able to do the test and not getting something out of it is the problem. He's still fun, he's still interesting, but if he were stronger, he'd be much higher. As it stands, I'm solving a puzzle for no gain. No opinion on Carolyn Fern. 
She's not interesting. Like, you have to ask your teammates, do you guys want to play like Winifred and Finn so I can feel good about healing your horror? Because if you're going to specialize in healing horror, you need teammates that give a shit. It's a very similar thing with Vincent, except Vincent's card pool is a much stronger and allows him to do much more interesting things. Carolyn Fern doesn't get access to the same level of powerful cards, and what she's giving, a resource, is also less valuable. The reality is that Carolyn Fern seems interesting from a deck building composition. There are certain teams that would really appreciate her, but honestly, she's just like a support character that no one needs. That's her identity. I'm actually moving her down to dislike this. What she's doing is fundamentally not very appealing to our table as a group. She's a support character in all the ways that you should be self-sufficient. You shouldn't be dying. You shouldn't be begging your team for money. You shouldn't be taking resource actions. And you shouldn't need to run bad healing like Liquid Courage. These are the problems that Carolyn Fern solves. So unless you're specifically allowing other characters to ignore those weaknesses by offering something that normally isn't there, there's not a lot of value in her. And that's just way too niche. Joe Diamond. I don't like Joe. I actually hate Joe. I'm going to be real with you. I never thought about how I personally felt about playing Joe until just now. I've done so much Joe theory craft. And just like with Calvin, I've handed it to our resident Joe main and watched him go. I don't like Joe. Joe has a clear problem. He's not able to fight without setting up. He's not able to find clues without setting up. And he's not able to not die to the mythos deck without setting up. Typically, a character can solve two of those problems. Which means that Joe Diamond is going to set up, and then he will do his job and not die. Wait, isn't that the baseline assumption for a character to function? Don't we need to do that on literally fucking everyone? His stat line's really bad. His card pool doesn't really support him being an excellent fighter, though he can be built as a functional fighter. He can be built as a very powerful kluver. Typically, what Joe wants is a teammate to say, Don't worry, dude, I can make you pass any test. Or Gloria, for instance, or Daryl. Joe really wants to be played alongside people who will protect him because he doesn't have time to excel in his role and be safe. And that's the major problem Joe faces. And the reason I hate Joe, I'm putting him in existential dread. Uh, in terms of my actual opinion on Joe, I think he's pretty cool. But the amount of time I have sunk into thinking about Joe and watching Joe get played and being like, wow, that's just as good as all the other Joe decks, which is slightly above average. Maybe next time, maybe big hand Joe is the ticket, right? Like, I have sunk so much time into Joe that I am tempted to put him in existential dread because he's a riddle that I cannot solve. And honestly, that's just the stat line. Joe Diamond doesn't just have one of the worst stat lines in the game. He has easily the worst stat line of any seeker. And he has the card pull from Guardians, which is the class diametrically opposed to seeker and identity. It is so frustrating trying to make him work. Every time I play a Joe deck, it's pretty cool. Every time I see a Joe deck get played, it's pretty cool. But thinking about Joe, Existential Dread. I don't know which to put him in. I'm going to leave him in pretty cool because I think Existential Dread is unfair to the character. I, I don't quite think I feel that way, but I want you to understand there is a conflict of interest here. Where I want to put him in two very different places for very different reasons. Okay, so Preston's weird, right? How do I feel about Dark Horse Preston? It's pretty cool. How do I feel about Big Money Preston? It's pretty cool. How do I feel about the build of Preston where you use two copies of Adaptable and you bank experience so that on scenario four or five, you spend like 20 experience and swap in four level zero cards and you transition from Dark Horse Preston to Big Money Preston. That's one of my favorite things in the entire game. I love that. But the actual deck you were playing... That's just pretty cool. The deck you are playing, that's just pretty cool. The transition period is something super interesting that I love. And it makes me think I'm going to rank his design and my overall opinion as very good. But I want to be clear, the actual deck doesn't deserve to be quite this high. It's specifically the idea of transitioning from no money to all the money as a big designed deck swap. No other character in the game has... Not only do they not do it, there's no reason they ever would. It doesn't make sense. It's super bizarre and only Preston does it, and I really like that. The idea of being a Dark Horse deck that pretends you're not actually wealthy because it's in your bank account's money, the idea of just being the best big money character because you make the most money, that's really fun. Like, those are cool decks, but they're not super interesting to me. The ability to transition from the weak early game win to the strong late game win, or that's the wrong way to phrase it. The ability to dodge the weak early game of big money by hard transitioning from Dark Horse, which is really strong at the start of a campaign but doesn't scale well, 
That's so fucking cool. It's my favorite thing in the game, but it's not my favorite character on the whole. Man, I don't like Diana. I, I want to put her in dislike. I don't even want to put her in no opinion. Why am I setting up to get five head? You know who has five head? A lot of mystics. Oh, she can get to six? That's really cool. I can play Pete, Sylvester, and Agnes and get to six and be invincible to horror damage. Like, the thing Diana does is not necessary. Every other mystic comes online faster. Other mystics get to the same number. Not that any of them need six. Diana's thing is that she gets to recur cancel effects. But you know what sucks? Wasting them in the first place so that you can recur them because you need to get your head online fast. Recurring them only has value if you use them efficiently the first time, which Diana doesn't get to do because she has to prioritize being online. And that makes me strongly dislike the character. That's pretty much the whole thing. Also, she's a really good user of like Cyclopean Hammer. There's reasons to fill her hands, but her signature knife doesn't let her do that unless you play Bandolier. Please don't play Bandolier Mystics. That's not the play. Don't do that. Her signature asset's also frustrating, but the main thing is the sales pitch for Diana is a fundamental failure. Getting five head is more than enough. Other characters start with it. If you needed six head, Agnes just does it easier than Diana does. If you want to recur cancel effects, you're not actually going to do that on Diana. Or you're not going to be a five head mystic. One of the two. Diana sucks. Diana just isn't... Diana as a character is strong. She's still a five to six head mystic that does a lot of canceling. The problem is that like she doesn't deliver on her sales pitch at all, and she's just a mystic with setup time for no reason. I hate Marie. I don't like Marie at all. <laughs> I feel like they're constantly printing Doom cards afraid that Marie's gonna break the game in half, so Doom archetype never works, and Marie's four book and four head don't get used in the same build, meaning her stat line is basically wasted. Marie's just not a very strong character, and the ways in which she isn't strong are super frustrating to try to solve. That's the long story short. I've made videos specifically about Marie before, so I'm not going to go on any further about why I don't enjoy Marie. I don't care how many times I see my Rita main play Rita and do well. It doesn't matter to me. I don't like Rita. You can tell me that she's strong and consistent, and I'm going to look at you in scenario three on turn two with dirty fighting and ornate bow in play. I'll be like, yeah, that's variance though. Let's see when you miss those cards. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I see Rita work. I refuse to believe she's reliable. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Now that said, I am actually now in the belief that if you have a Rita on your team, you want a flex fighter that's really good at flex fighting or just like doing something approximately like flex fighting that turns off the enemies. Beats a different case. I really don't mind that I think she's not reliable and takes setting up even as the main fighter. That's fine. What I do mind is that in exchange for solving the puzzle of how to use your foot to do your job, you are now just an okay character. You're not even particularly strong. Like that, that does bother me quite a lot. The fact that you need certain assets to do your job and then you don't excel in your role, like just play someone else. Why would I bother? Oh, also the hoods are hilariously mean and I don't know why that weakness is so unnecessarily harsh. But speaking of, we have Tommy Muldoon. I want to be abundantly clear when I say this about Tommy Muldoon. If they printed an alternate weakness for him, it could make him one of the most fun and powerful investigators in the game. His weakness was designed to cripple his ability, to make it so that you could never tank for your whole team and soak all the damage in the world with your allies and make all the money in the world to play more allies. The dream of tank Tommy with a dozen ally assets is killed by rookie mistake. And that's inherently incredibly frustrating. The fact that Becky is not, in fact, better than most other weapons and building around Becky as your main weapon is just a waste of time is the death knell in me ever liking this character. He's already slated for hated. Here's the really, really bad thing. Because I've played Tommy. I've seen Tommy played. I have standalone in-game tested Tommy decks designed to use Mega Becky to make sure that I was right about this. And it it it's so frustrating. Fundamentally... Becky decks don't fucking work. Because here's what happens. Did the enemy spawn and you kill them immediately? Okay, you used bullets. So you did your job well, and now your gun's empty. What do you do? Oh, you're going to engage the enemy and let them hit you to kill your allies to reload your gun. That's very efficient, isn't it? That's so much worse than just playing extra ammo or a new weapon. If Tommy Muldoon has built Super Becky and successfully kills the enemies without taking damage, which is the goal of a fighter, 
then it results in a situation where you must play inefficiently to put more bullets into Becky very frequently. That fundamental lock that being successful empties your gun and results in you playing badly to try to get more bullets is the most frustrating thing in the world. Nothing about Tommy works well, and the best way to play Tommy is to not buy charisma, not focus on having allies, not focus on Becky, and just play a four-fist guardian survivor fighter. And that's deeply fucking frustrating. And to put into perspective just how bad rookie mistake was, if there was a guardian weakness that said, discard all beat cops you control. If no beat cops are discarded by this effect, shuffle this back into your deck. That would be a harsher weakness than most guardians have. And that is like the minimum reading of rookie mistake. It's so incredibly strong. It interferes with the basic guardian strategies and it kills the idea you see when you first see Tommy's I like you want to build the lots of allies tank Tommy. And that idea requires you to dig your weakness out by drawing your deck before you can do it. And there's no efficient way to do that as a guardian. I unironically had a campaign, a standalone I did before Mandy got tabooed, where I played Mandy with no stolen five to pull Tommy's weakness from his deck so I could try tank Tommy. You know what it did? Nothing exceptional. It encountered severe problems with its economy because it was trying to play a lot of allies from turn one. So it didn't come on until later. And I realized then that I was just playing Zoe with extra steps. I hate everything about Tommy Muldoon. And it all comes down to his two signature cards, his asset that's not better than other weapons and doesn't work unless you're having problems and his weakness that ruins his character card. So when it comes to new Mandy Thompson post taboo, I don't like her. Here's my full opinion. I think having a 57 card deck isn't fun. I don't like doing that. I don't like having to put that many cards in my deck. I don't like trying to find specific cards when there are 50 cards I put in there four weaknesses, and a three signature assets, or events rather, that I don't particularly want. Mandy Thompson is not fun to play because she is unreliable, in spite of the fact that she is the scrying character, because you have to find your scrying assets in your massive deck, and then you're scrying a smaller percentage of your overall deck. Also, every time I play Mandy, I'm reminded of the fact that she used to be the best character in the game, and she is a pale shadow of her former self. Don't get me wrong, she's a five-head seeker with mythos stats that aren't bad. She's still very strong. She's still in the top half of characters in the game, for sure. But I do not think Mandy Thompson is actually fun to play or think about at all in her current state. Hey, yo, it's your boy, Tony Morgan. He's here to do everything. Hopefully you can get the clues because he's not as good at that. But like if you can't do it, he will use well connected and his billions of actions every turn to just get them himself. Tony Morgan is so fucking stupidly good at his job and also invincible. Like, it's not true in the first part of the scenario. He does have a little bit of set of time. He's definitely sketchy in scenario one where he has to use rogue weapons and they tend to have downsides that are alarming, like giving enemies retaliate before you have all your fist pumps in the deck. Like, Tony Morgan has some issues. But I always have a blast playing Tony Morgan. I, I look at Tony Morgan and I'm like, he shouldn't be there. He should be in love this. A Tony Morgan... You, you play Tony Morgan, you show up as a deep one bull, you got brass knuckles on, you auto fail, you're going to fucking die. Like, it should be stressful and bad. And Tony Morgan does have design issues and he's bad for the game because everything gets printed, gets printed around him. But I don't care. None of that matters. I love playing Tony Morgan. Clear favorite. Easy choice. Oh, hey, it's Luke Robinson. Welcome to Clear Favorites again. <laughs> I, I was trying to justify for a brief moment why I would put him anywhere else. He has the most fun ability in the game. Gatebox is so much fun. You can just leave. Not only are you the fastest, most mobile character in the game, also you can have like three hunters hunt to Tony, or sorry, to Luke, and then you jump in the gate box, and they're all just like look around and shrug and do nothing, and you've wasted multiple turns in the enemies in the way that no other character can for one action to get out of the gate box on your next turn. It's incredible. On top of all that, he's one of the most powerful, self-sustaining flex characters in the game. He can just really easily do everything with a true magic build because he has the seeker cards to find true magic efficiently as well as all the spells it'll need. You can do other stuff. There's a lot of builds for Luke because he's just really good. I think true magic is definitively the best one and I love true magic as a card. So there's no reason for me to play other builds of Luke since it's not only the best one, but my favorite one. True magic is legitimately one of my favorite cards. I, I do think the fact that it's not interesting but the fact that it, like, what it does, how it affects you playing as a mystic is so strong and so satisfying. 
and Luke's the best user of it. On addition to being a mystic that has great movement and great draw, you know, the two weaknesses that hold down most of the mystics is bad mobility, bad draw, and Luke is the most mobile character with top tier draw. Oh, he's incredible. I love playing Luke. I haven't played Patrice. I'm going to put Patrice in very good, though. I've really liked watching my teammates play Patrice, and I think that Patrice's gimmick is fun to think about and fun to build around, and on the whole, a very good power level is reached by solving that puzzle. There are other characters where just the stat line is the puzzle, and that's not an interesting puzzle, and solving it doesn't result in a powerful character, and Patrice has a much more interesting puzzle with a much more powerful result, and that's pretty much why I like Patrice in a nutshell. I don't like Sister Mary. I might put her in no opinion. I'm putting her in no opinion because I appreciate that she is a bless enabler, and that has a lot of positive ramifications for the rest of your team. However, if someone were playing Sister Mary selfishly and just like enabling a Holy Spirit, that deck is so shit, I hate that. I don't have positive opinions about Sister Mary, and it's only her ability to enable Bless for other people while being a functional fighting character that lets me rank her this highly in the first place. Oh yeah, I love Amanda Sharp. She's not a clear favorite of mine, but her gimmick is one of the most powerful gimmicks in the game. It's really satisfying to try to build towards and get the most investigates possible with deduction level two in one turn. She's just a very strong, very fun character. I don't like that people try to say she's a flex character because they can use Vicious Blow and the Red Gloved Man. Like, yeah, but what about the rest of the campaign before you had that? You weren't a flex. If they didn't need you before, why are you doing that now? However, all of that said, Amanda's really cool and the fact that she can do that is really cool. I really love this character and I have nothing bad to say about Amanda. All right, send help because I'm about to put Trish and I don't like this territory and I don't know why. I, I picked up Trish. I put her at the top of the tier list because that's where she goes in power level. And then I just slowly moved her down until I felt like she was in the right place. And I didn't stop until I got to dislike. And I think part of the reason is as a rogue main, the fact that one of the best rogues is a seeker in a trench coat does bother me. Like she's not really a rogue. Don't lie to me. She's really strong with big money, of course, but she's also really strong as the tempo, more seeker oriented build. But as both of those things, she doesn't feel like as a seeker, she doesn't feel like a rogue. And as a big money character, she feels like it's begrudging. Like you didn't want to build Trish as a big money character. I don't know. I could ramble at length about Trish, but at the end of the day, I don't know why I don't like Trish. Something about her just isn't fun to me. And I couldn't tell you why. <laughs> I don't actually know why, like, power level wise, she's not, she's incredible, but I don't know why I don't like her as a character. The fact that she has got, like, almost no rogue identity, despite being that powerful, is kind of insulting to me. I think that's what it is. I just personally dislike how much she doesn't feel like a rogue. So why does Tony get to be here? <laughs> oh, that's easy. Stabbing is way more fun than finding clues. Like I said, Tony probably doesn't deserve to be this high. He's just really fun to play. I played a lot of Seekers. I don't really care about playing a Seeker, and Trish is just a Seeker at a slightly higher power level, which is a weird sentence to say, and there are definitely Seekers that beat her. But like, yeah, Tony is doing something no one else does. Trish is just a Seeker, but she's the wrong color, and it does kind of bother me a little bit. Oh no, I don't like Dexter Drake either. Shit. Uh, Dexter Drake is also very, very good, and his ability seems really, really cool. But then I build Dex for Dexter. I'm like, all right, the most efficient use of this ability is to replay my arcane asset as a fast action. Because if you want to run like a switchblade to turn a card into an action, that's going to be really draw oriented in terms of whether or not it actually works and does anything. And it's not actually that good in the first place. Like the more you build into Dexter's ability, the worse your deck gets. And I fucking hate that. It's not fun. Dexter's a good character and playing Dexter is fun. But it's sort of like a minuscule version of what happens with Tommy where playing towards the thing you do isn't good. The more shit assets you put in your deck to try to capitalize on being Dexter Drake, the worse you get. The best Dexter Drake in my experience has been the most boring Dexter Drake, and that does make me like him less. Man, I'm just putting good characters in dislike here, aren't I? Holy shit. Uh, here's Silas, boys. I don't like him either. Oh, that's heresy. Very People are not going to be happy about that one. Here's why I don't like Silas. I cannot think of a main fighter with worse weapons than Silas. I, Rita. Rita's here. All right. There's one. <laughs> the other survivor fighter that's not a guardian is here. Survivor weapons absolutely suck. I do not want someone showing up with Fire Axe, Meat Cleaver, or Time Worn Brand in Scenario 6. Those things do not make me happy. 
And as it turns out, that's almost guaranteed what Silas Marsh will be doing. If there was slightly more support for Chainsaw to make it a more reasonable main plan, I wouldn't mind. If there was an alternative thing, like Hank Sampson's going to be in the next expansion, maybe there'll be support. And I'm telling you, if there is just a good survivor weapon for Silas to use, like, straight to love this tier. The problem is that main fighter Silas, which is clearly the thing he is best suited for, is not able to use a good weapon. And when I say a good weapon, I want to be very clear, a weapon that offers action compression. I do not want my fighter to have three actions per turn and hit for two damage in scenario six. That is not enough. That is not nearly enough. So the fact that Silas is doing that makes me hate him. This is entirely a how I view optimizing the game sort of thing. And Silas fails to hit that benchmark and you cannot build him differently to solve it. There's not a way to get that three damage. Don't talk to me about brute force. That's twice a scenario. Shut up. I really just hate Silas's weapon choice, and that that's why he's here. That's the entire thing. And I'm going to be real with you. If Hank Sampson shows up in the next campaign and there are no good weapons with him for him to use, we don't know his card pool yet. Maybe he already has them. He He's set to be in my clear favorites. He's completely busted. He's absolutely insane. Uh, if he's boring enough, he might go down to love this or even very good. But if he's printed without any generically good weapon for Survivor, he's going one tier above Silas, because his stats are a lot better and it takes less work to make him work. But as much cool shit as Silas does, the reality is that right now his best build is Dark Horse Silas to flex, because then you get to use Mariner's Compass, and you have action compression, and Fighter Silas does not get action compression. And reliability is a prerequisite. I don't care if he's passing his test, you have to do that. So that's why I don't like Silas. Anyways, Daniela Rays. Where'd I put Yorick? So Yorick is here. And you do what Yorick does, but in the most boring way possible. Yeah, that sounds like pretty cool. Like two whole tiers below Yorick, that sounds right. Oh, and I have not been organizing these people by how much I hate them. However, my top and bottom are currently still correct. I hate Tony the most, or sorry, Tommy the most. And I love Parallel Pete the most. That might be recency bias on Pete though. Daniela Rays just doesn't die and hits people really reliably. She's not interesting. She's very good, but she's not interesting. But what she's doing is a fairly non-traditional way where she's intentionally taking damage to rebound damage. The, like, Briarthorn's tank sort of build is not actually in the game outside of her, and that does get her outside of no opinion. Even if she is just hitting for two, she's doing some other stuff to hit for more. She has the action compression, unlike Silas. So I do think she's pretty cool. Ah, shit, Norman, what do you do? I'm not even joking. Norman's a character where I'm like, I know you use Astronomical Atlas. <laughs> And I know there's clever builds with him that use other cards. My brain has forgotten them. One second. I reviewed the decks for Norman. And the answer is that Norman jumps through a lot of hoops to play deduction every turn. I have no opinions on Norman. <laughs> like, I, I would have remembered what he did and how he did it instantly if I actually cared about it. He gets more clues than a normal character by compressing actions. Which makes him very good. It does not make him interesting or fun. I'm sorry, Norman. All right, I hate Monterey Jack. He's going and hate this. Maybe our new resident Monterey Jack main will change my mind someday. But right now, he gets Rogue Zero, which is not the good part of Rogue. And Seeker 1 to 5 is incredible, but Seeker 0 is even better, and he only gets five of those. Deck building for Monterey Jack is a deeply frustrating issue. Then, Monterey Jack's signature makes him entirely self-sufficient, and allows him to just hang out on his own, he'll be fine. But there is nothing about his card pool other than the bullwhip that makes him a flex character, meaning that he's basically just a main kluver that wants to wander off and evade people. And, like, that's not actually a good identity. I don't like that at all. If you're just going to evade, if you're just going to bullwhip and you have to draw the bullwhip with five foot, as I've said earlier, foot's hard to do. You actually want more than five if you're trying to evade because you're not getting bonuses from anything. If you find a four foot guy and you're trying to evade at five off on your own, you're gonna have a bad time. Like Monterey Jack actually just kinda sucks. Not as a character, as a character he's actually kinda strong. I've been pleasantly surprised by him so far. But like thinking about Monterey Jack is just deeply frustrating. And I feel like as a design concept, like rogues don't have anything to do with moving. So the fact that he is part rogue doesn't make sense to me. I guess the part of him that's rogue is that he has five foot and a signature asset that only lets him evade, right? Like, that's what's rogue about him. 
I don't know. This just feels like an effort to make Seeker, the hybrid Seeker, a bad character by making them rogue. I, I don't know how else to say my opinion on Monterey Jack. I don't like thinking about him because, like, every time I have a problem, I'm like, oh, yeah, do X. And it'll be like, add deep knowledge, you're a Seeker. Oh, I'm using my five flex slots already. Uh, add easy mark, you need economy. Nope, don't get rogue one. Like, every time you have a problem with Monterey Jack, it's always his card pool that's the problem. It's so frustrating. It's so incredibly frustrating building Monterey Jack decks. So, like, playing him is fine, but thinking about him to get to the part where you play him, hate that. Hate it to death. I really like Lily Chen. I think she's a very cool character. And, yes, when you play Lily Chen, you hit people with stick. That's what she do. She hit people with stick. At first, stick is Dragon Pull. Later on, stick is Cyclopean Hammer. Maybe it's the Axe now. Who knows? You do just hit people with melee weapons when you're playing Lily Chen, and admittedly, that's kind of boring. However, I think her deck building to get there is actually fairly unique amongst Guardians because, well, she isn't one. I like having Spectral Razor and Guardians a lot. Like, unironically, that's part of why Zoe gets to be here. And I almost moved this Zoe up because of Spectral Razor. It's a very good card in Guardian. It makes the character feel a lot better. I think Lily Chen is... But the thing about Lily Chen that I really like is actually... Are, are they called balances? Disciplines? I think they're called disciplines. Those are really fun. And yes, you will take them in the order that matters the most, meaning you take Fist first. You're going to be prioritizing stats a lot. But I really enjoy late game Lily Chin with, I think it's the foot discipline that allows you to take three different attack actions. So you're like running different spells and weird sidearms to try to get the full value of that. And you have a burst action available to you that most fighters simply don't have. I just really like the disciplines and the fact that she is a fighter that does not just use gun and the way they use melee weapons is not traditional. She's probably a more boring character now that Machete's been untabooed, to be honest. Like, when I played her, Machete was tabooed at that time, and I specifically said, like, if there was another melee weapon for level 0 Lily, she'd be one of the best characters in the game. And since then, like, the rules of the game have changed a lot. A lot of new weapons have been added, a lot of new cards have been added. But getting Machete back is a huge bop to her. But it also kind of might make her less interesting. Unironically, I'm moving her down to pretty cool, because the Dragon Pole is just less mandatory with Machete. Admittedly, it does take up a level 0 slot now, but still. Oh, I fucking hate Bob. I hate Bob to bits. Oh, get him out of here. I hate it. I don't understand why people say Bob is good. I have videos about Bob. You'll notice if I made a video about not understanding a character, they're ending up and hate this. So Bob specializes in playing item assets, which typically is a thing a team needs, meaning that Bob is giving your team actions and is inherently good. The issue is that Bob's book of four with Survivor Zero and Rogue One Plus does not do a damn thing. It just sorta sucks. I tried multiple builds of Bob. I could not find a single build that felt like I was good at finding clues. I feel like Bob is a designated third wheel character where you are playing a secondary Kluver with team support and you need a really strong fighter to make up for you being there. I don't like that. I don't know how to play a Bob that actually carries his weight on clue finding. And I'm not asking for your advice either, because I've done that in the past. I've listened to your advice, and I have not been satisfied with it. I hate Bob, and I am happy to continue hating him and put no further thought into him ever again. He can sell a snake oil to someone else. I'm not interested. Oh, it's my boy Harvey. Get up here. Love you. Harvey's fantastic. I, I might like Harvey. This might be like Ursula. This might be like Ursula before he moves down immediately. And I'm actually, like, pushing back against hate makes me like him more. Harvey's insane. He's so strong. And people talk shit about it. They're like, oh, he has a bad card pool. What are you talking about? Every time I play a character with non-seeker cards like Daisy Walker, I get like Warrior Protection, Promise of Power, and nothing else. It's like 26 seeker cards. It's very hard to want cards that aren't seeker cards when you have access to seeker cards. Oh, his weakness will kill you? No, it won't. It'll kill Mr. Rook. Who gives a shit? It'll kill my bulletproof vest if I'm really stressing about it and feel like making sure it never happens, which I usually do. But like, no, his weakness is not a problem. You just don't hold a million cards in your hand. You don't buy Dream Enhancing Serum and kill yourself. You make any effort to run Physical Soak and you'll be fine. He draws so many cards. He has a literally perfect stack spread. Uh, by the way, 4512 is perfect. It's five and a do-something stat, one and the other, and then a 4-2 split on Mythos is, in my opinion, perfect. Mathematically, it's about equal to a 3-3 split, but I find it's easier to reliably pass one test than to try to make both of them work. 
You can argue it's a side grade to Mandy Thompson. They're both perfect, though. But Harvey's stat line is incredible. His ability to just draw a card is incredible. The fact that you can use it on your teammates is incredible because I don't know if you know this, but when you play deep knowledge, right, you lose one card and you draw three. Yeah, that's what it does. You spend an action to go up two cards. Harvey's ability says that if someone spends a draw action, you can make them draw a second card. Anyone on your team can play deep knowledge at will without putting curses in the bag if you are Harvey Walters. I just need to make that clear. I want to be really clear, like, it's not a small thing. It's absolutely broken. It's one of the strongest team support abilities in the game. I know it's once per round. You don't need to tell me that. Uh, it's insane. Like, yeah, you're usually using it on yourself because you're Harvey Walters. You're more important than them. You're the seeker, and also you can kill all the enemies in the game if you want to do that. But, like, Harvey Walters... Oh, by the way, Farsight Occult Lexicon. Just in case you needed to kill the boss... Harvey Walters can reliably deal nine damage in two actions. It's not a problem. He does everything at an obscene level of efficiency. And since foot treacheries, you know, the things he fails usually deal health damage. The thing he builds to deal with his weakness. He's just got no vulnerabilities. He's absolutely insane. He's in clear favorites entirely because of his strength. I don't think he's interesting at all. I think like, yeah, you build around your weakness, and that's kind of cool. When you try to optimize far side and play big hand in a way that no one else can really enable, and that's kind of cool. But no, he's here entirely because of his power level. He's one of the most fun, powerful characters in the game. I love Harvey. He's my boy. I don't love Jacqueline. She she lives in no opinion. Like, Jacqueline is a five-head mystic that negates the autofail once a turn. Not negates. Uh, She predicts and avoids the autofail every turn, right? You have to declare ahead of time. But, like, you know that when you're rolling Flamethrower against a four health enemy, that's the Jacqueline Fine roll, right? Like, it's pretty obvious. The thing she's doing is just boring. Like, she's just boring with a really strong ability, and that's all there is to it. I, I wish I wish I had a feeling about Jacqueline Fine, because she's one of the best characters in the game. And I actually genuinely think she stands to be one of the best characters in the game. Like, top five, even, with the next expansion, because she can be played as a blessed team member. And she just buys the Tome of Solomon, doesn't do anything else. She just gets that and leeches off the blesses. And now she's also the best healer in the game, right? Like, that's crazy. Jacqueline Fine is insanely strong, but she's not interesting. And this is how much I like you, not how good you are. I love Stella Clark. I've heard people call her boring. And maybe this is just the power gamer and me liking things that are strong. But difficulty zero main Kluver Stella Clark is so much fun. Like, you build a tech around it, like, you just don't care if you fail and you don't have book. So you either negate the test and get the clues, or you intentionally fail the test for benefits from failing and then get the action back. It's such a satisfying sort of deck to play. Like, it's not actually that clever, but it feels very clever, and it's very strong and very different. She's relentlessly durable. She has a lot of team value. She's just a really strong, fun character to play that no one else shares the playstyle of. And yeah, she only does the one thing, but like, that's fine. I don't need to play Stella a second time with a different deck. I'll just play someone else. So I really, really like Stella. I think she's a wonderful design and very unique. Not one of my favorites, but really, really cool. So on my power tier list, I considered putting Carson at the very top. Because realistically, Carson is as good as the teammates you pair him with. He is absolutely incredible. However, I don't know if I should do that. And I'm talking about that to stall over time because I don't know how I actually feel about Carson. He's a pretty cool design. Carson is not the best. He's not super fun to play because you're just giving actions to your teammates. But I do think it's a fun puzzle, especially in three player, trying to figure out what to do with your one action a turn, right? Like you give one action to each partner, your free action's given to somebody. I think I'm settling on putting Carson Sinclair in pretty cool. The puzzle of how to spend your two actions, you give one to your Kluver, one to your fighter, it's a three-player game, you have two for yourself. Where do you move? Do you put what asset into play? What other ways do you give team support? I think that's a fun puzzle to solve. He's a pretty one-note character. He's not super interesting. But what he does within the game and for the game is actually very, very cool. If he were more fun to play, he'd be going to very good. But he's not, so he's doomed pretty cool, unfortunately. I really like Vincent Lame. I played a Runic Axe Flex Vincent that I was really happy with, where I always felt like I was contributing, and I was doing a bunch of really cool shit, and I I just have nothing bad to say about him. Unlike Carolyn, who heals people to give them resources and horror healing, I'm giving them unexpected courage on Vincent. That's really valuable. 
I, I don't know what else to say. Giving someone unexpected courage is guaranteed to be a good thing that will contribute meaningfully to the game. And it makes them a valuable team support. Because even if you don't really need the physical healing, that's just a prerequisite for giving you what I really give you. Unexpected courage. The physical healing is immaterial. It's not important. The only reason I have not had teammates try to take damage in the Mythos phase so they could get unexpected courage from me is because everyone at my table knew I was playing Vincent, so they all took in the thick of it for at least one physical damage so I could heal them immediately. And when your teammates are playing that much around the team support you have, that's cool. I, I love Vincent. He has things that... No, he's a support character that matters. Carson is a support character that matters, and playing him sucks, but Vincent is meaningfully contributing in all fronts. It's the complete opposite. In fact, I think I love Vincent. I only didn't put him that high originally because uh, our brief period of time Vincent made spent a lot of time playing decks that I thought like weren't super interesting. He played like Fighter Vincent and Kluver Vincent, but I think Flex Vincent's a genuinely very well designed, very fun character that I love having on the team. Do I have no opinion on Kaimani or do I dislike Kaimani? I dislike Kaimani. I almost hate Kaimani, but I don't hate Kaimani. The problem with them is pretty straightforward. Needing to spend two actions to kill an enemy really sucks against two fist enemies that have two health. And there's a lot of like the shitter enemies that you're just supposed to hit with a machete and they die. And Kaimani wants to engage them, evade them, and evade them again when the Kluver draws them. Mark Harrigan just shoots a revolver over the Kluver's head, done in one action, not a problem, right? Like, it's not the way they play to make use of their ability as anything other than a flex character kind of sucks. And even as a flex character, you have hoops to jump through. I find that a character that specializes in doing something that is not efficient and trying to get value out of that is a puzzle not worth solving. That's my opinion on Kaimani. It's my opinion on many other characters. And that's really just it. If Kaimani's ability weren't fundamentally inefficient, I'd have a better opinion of them. But it is. So everything I do is colored in that sour perspective. Charlie Kane's such a stupid character. I think I love Charlie Kane. The Summoned Hound build is so funny, where you just get to use Summoned Hound three times a turn, and like the rest of your actions don't really matter. I think that I love Charlie Kane. If you had access to something as fun as Summoned Hound from the beginning of the game, it would be a clear favorite for me. I like that you can try to build other Charlies, but I'm never going to play not Summoned Hound Charlie. It's just so obviously powerful compared to anything else you can do. I think Charlie Kane is a really interesting puzzle to solve, and it is a puzzle worth solving. Chance Encounter Summoned Hound is such a clever, interesting thing to do. You'll notice that trend, right? He's making use of jank cards that don't see a lot of play, and I like him a lot. The issue with Charlie Kane is very much that, like, like it, it just doesn't exist in Scenario 1 the same way Ashcans does. It's not as powerful as Ashcans, which is hard for me to stomach saying, because I don't want Ashcan Pete to be good. I want Parallel Ashcan to suck, because it doesn't look like it should work on paper. But that's why I love him so much. Uh, Charlie Kane is just a really interesting character to sort out, and when you do solve that puzzle, it feels like it was worth solving. Which brings us to Gloria. Existential Dread Tier. Don't like her. Fucking hate Gloria. I'm gonna be. I don't mind playing as Gloria. I feel like I'm having a good time. You know who doesn't? My teammates. I hate playing alongside Gloria. We have a house rule at our table that we made after our first blind playthrough of Innsmouth where I played Gloria Goldberg. We said we're never playing Gloria Goldberg in a blind campaign ever again because we didn't know what Innsmouth was supposed to be like. Because anytime a Mythos card was threatening, it just didn't happen instead. And do you know how many times you played Gloria Goldberg since then? We've never played her again. We don't need to. We know how strong she is. We would like to actually see the game try to do something. Gloria Goldberg is fun to play, and she's the most powerful character in the game. I stand by that statement wholeheartedly, and I will die on this hill. She is so strong that she invalidates the game. That's literally what she does. She is too good at activating her ability. The reason she has not been printed in an expansion is because if they give her direct support, it will make her even a more comically powerful, and it will be a balance issue. I think that's probably a fair assessment. It's already a balance issue. She's absolutely egregiously out of line. The game is just turned off in a way by her that it... Like, with Daryl, I'm meeting out resources to kind of mitigate the encounter deck. With Gloria, the encounter deck is fully mitigated. There is no resource measurement. It is not a little bit mitigated. It is offline. She's not fun to play with. Or as. Because the game is not doing anything. You just go around and you investigate. The enemies will not be able to kill you if they show up. And the encounter cards you get will be cards that test your best skill. 
and they won't do much anyway, because if they did, we'd have discarded them. Gloria just ruins the game. She's too strong. Like, she's too strong in a way where, like, yeah, Tony Morgan ruins the game. He kills the boss enemy the turn it shows up every time. But it's, he's doing the thing. He's rolling the dice to stab them. He's playing the game. Gloria is changing the game to be a walkover. He, they're not steamrolling the game. The game's just a pleasant meadow with no obstacles in it. And that's why I hate Gloria. Now, I could look at this and try to draw overarching opinions about how I feel about classes from this. But to be honest, I've been rambling for almost two hours now. And I do not have it in me to try to draw overarching assessments from where I actually place things. So instead, I'm going to give some quick opinions about how I feel off the top of my head. I really enjoy playing Seekers. I imagine the tier list mostly respects that because they're generally speaking high tempo, very efficient, very powerful characters, and very few of them are genuinely boring. Most of them have something cool going on. Mystics suck. Is there another mystic other than the crop? No, no, there are two and pretty cool. One's not a mystic, don't believe her lies. The other one is a parallel curse character that just came out. Mystics are just boring, immobile, low tempo characters where their own assets randomly fuck them over some of the time, and they only do the one thing. They test head to do whatever job they picked. Luke Robinson breaks out of that mold pretty severely, and other than that, I just don't enjoy playing Mystics, and neither does anyone at my table. Rogues are all over the place. Some rogues are just other classes in a trench coat, other rogues are the roguiest rogues that ever were, and a lot of rogues are just kind of bad. Uh, there's Safina. Uh, who was I acting for? Skids, there we go. I was looking for Kaimani and Skids when I said some rogues are just kind of bad. Rogues are just all over the shop as a class. I don't feel like they have a consistent identity anymore. They just have a lot of foot cards that most of them don't want to play anyway. Whereas survivors also feel like a grab bag, but it feels like an intentional identity of the grab bag. The rogues feel like they're all over the shop, but not in a designed, organized way that's really fun and clever like survivors. Guardians are boring. That's my opinion on Guardians. My my only Guardian in my top two tiers is Flex Mark Harrigan. That uses Bestow Resolve and Winging it. That tells you how I feel about Guardians. I just don't think they're really well designed. They just kill the man. That's what they do. And they all do it more or less the same way. As I wrap this video up, I now realize at the end of the editing process, I wanted to nip something in the bud in case somebody watched this video and thought, wow, this guy really doesn't like Arkham. Look how much he dislikes. There are more positive tiers, just flat out. There are four positive tiers and only three negative tiers. There are way more people in my clear favorites and love these than hate this plus existential dread combined. You have people in existential dread like Parallel Wendy, where I've never really disliked the character. I just think about them and I get a headache and stop. So first of all, there's that. There's legitimately just more people ranked higher than lower. And if you think otherwise, reread the chart, you're wrong. But the other thing is, this is my opinion of the character, not of playing them, of how they are supposed to work, of their character design, of building decks for them, of putting them into team compositions. It's really like, how much do I like the character conceptually at thinking about them? I love the act of playing Arkham. It doesn't matter if I'm playing Carolyn Fern or Nacho or Silas, or even characters that deeply frustrate me like Marie Lambeau and Bob, or Tommy Muldoon and Gloria, where I think they have tremendous problems either as a character or for the game. No matter which character I'm playing, I have a really good time. So I just wanted to include that. I obviously fucking love the game. If you've gotten any other impression from watching this, then I have to apologize for apparently voicing my opinions in a deeply confusing and misleading way, because I love the game. And if you came away with any other impression, then either I'm bad at talking or you're bad at listening. And I'm inclined to believe it's the former. After all, I am rather incoherent. Anyways, thank you for watching. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, Evan and Jeffrey B. And I'll see you in the next one.